Thank you very much. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. I'd also like to say thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to be here, be here and congratulate the Refugee Action Committees in Australia and all around the world for the tremendous work they're doing in keeping this issue on the political agenda. I want to acknowledge the work done by, by my medical colleagues also in the group Doctors for Refugees. We're united by an appalling sense of shame at what the Australian Government is doing to vulnerable people. And I was going to say we're united by a sense of shame at what is being done in our name, but this is not being done in our name. We reject what the Government is doing with every bit of humanity we have within us. We see innocent... see innocent lives destroyed and people treated as playthings merely for cheap, grubby and offensive political capital. This is not being done in our name. I've been asked to comment a little on the global context which other speakers have also mentioned and the wars that are creating the current refugee crisis. Globally, the number of people fleeing war or persecution is about 65 million people. This is unprecedented. They are either internal refugees within their own country or they're trying to find safety in another country. Half of the world's refugees come from three countries, Syria, Afghanistan and Somalia. The catastrophe that's occurring in Syria demonstrates starkly the human costs of wars in a region that Australia helped destabilise in 2003 and a region where Australia is still supporting the violence that is occurring there. We are told that there are noble motives for the Australian Government for our Defence Force participation in these wars, such as protecting innocent lives. And yet our Government's concern for innocent lives is so great that the civilians in these places are not even counted. There is no official Australian Government estimate of the civilians and civilian need in the areas where we are engaged in bombing. No estimate of the numbers of people, the uh, what's required to look after them. We are forever ready to join the bombing of these places, but then we forget about the people affected by it. Our leaders talk about the importance of democracy, but the leadership of both our big, two biggest political parties refuse to consider a role for our parliament in a decision to go to war, which is the biggest decision a country can make. Both Labor and the Coalition refuse to acknowledge the dangers which were so amply demonstrated in 2003 of a system in which a decision to go to war can be made by one person, the Prime Minister and former Prime Minister John Howard, who dragged Australia into the invasion of Iraq illegally in 2003, still walks free. Australians for War Powers Reform are working to ensure that any decision for war is made by our Parliament and not by one person. Then there might be some important questions asked before our troops are deployed and not after such as, what's the military strategy? What's the likely duration? What are the economic costs? What's the exit strategy? And importantly, what are the human costs likely to be? How many civilians are going to be affected? How will they be cared for? What budget is set aside for providing shelter, food, medical care for the refugees? And how many of the refugees from the proposed war is Australia going to accept? All of these questions need to be asked before Australia goes to war. And as for our strategy in Syria, which is virtually non-existent, one can only wonder, as the US now finds itself fighting on two sides of that particular conflict. Increasingly, warfare seems to be all we know what to do, how to do in response to conflict and tension. Australia's diplomacy and conflict resolution skills are grossly degraded while our war fighting capacity is escalating and we're becoming less secure as a result. Australia is the only US ally that has joined every major US war since World War II. 
And yet when people, when people flee the war zones that we've helped create, then we turn our back on them. We just don't want to know about it. Australia's hypocrisy goes further on the issue of weapons of mass destruction. When chemical weapons are used in Syria, Australian leaders are appropriately, appropriately outraged, although we should note that they instantly seem to know who did it, even before there's an investigation, but setting that aside. Those same Australian leaders refuse to rule out the use of weapons on our behalf, which are in fact even more catastrophic than heinous chemical weapons, and that's nuclear weapons. Australia is right now trying to undermine historic negotiations at the United Nations for a treaty to explicitly ban the possession and use of nuclear weapons. Once again, we're doing the bidding of our Pacific ally on the greatest security threat that we face, which is nuclear weapons. Check the website of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons for some more information on this. And I want to mention that there are differences between Labor and the Coalition on this. Labor, since 2015, has had a policy in support of a nuclear weapons ban treaty. Congratulations to Labor for that. And of course, the Greens are very strong supporters. There will be a women's march, everybody welcome, a women's march to ban the bomb on Saturday, June 17. So watch out for news of that one. The final group I want to mention, which is doing terrific work, is IPAN. Not ICAN, but IPAN, the Independent and Peaceful Australian Network. His name tells you what the network is all about. Australia has been constantly at war for over 15 years. Being at war is becoming the norm for us. IPAN has a statement calling for independent thinking in Australia, particularly on the issue of going to war. And the statement calls also for Australia to stay out of US wars. If you'd like to sign that statement, and I would strongly encourage you to, there's a gentleman in the middle with a funny bike helmet who's got um, copies of that statement. If we want our leaders, current and future, to adopt more peaceful, just and compassionate policies, for Australia, then we are all going to have to work very, very hard. The past year globally has been a wake-up call, particularly with the election in the United States, of a man who epitomises the divisive, violent and aggressive policies that are causing so much human misery around the world. The role of civil society is now absolutely critical. Wherever you see your particular energies being best used, I urge you to do all that you personally can to help create a world that is more just and more peaceful. And together, we must redouble our efforts for the sake of refugees and asylum seekers, for the sake of those caught up in war zones who can't even escape to another country, and for the sake of all those whose lives are threatened by the new wars that are looming. So look around and just see how active civil society already is. In addition, we have some very good parliamentarians. They need support. Support them so that they can keep pushing for change. There are some good journalists. Support them too. And I think one of the best things that we can do for peace and justice is to make sure that truth survives in this country as one of our most important values. Support good journalism. and subscribe to publications that are delivering it and be prepared to pay for it to the extent that you can. Good journalists are our lifeline to a world that is not post-factual and post-truth but is in fact, post, um, but is in fact pa factual and based on truth. I'm going to finish with the words of Dr Bernard Lowne who is a co-founder of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And Dr Lowne said... Never whisper in the presence of wrong. And that's our challenge. Thank you very much.